Welcome to Why America, a podcast in which we explore the process of becoming a United States citizen and why immigrants want to become legal Americans now more than ever. I'm Natalia Navarro. This time on Why America, we're focusing on the process of naturalization itself. In a nutshell, a person files form N-400, and that, that's the name of the form, and there's a bunch of documents that go with it. They file it, and then they wait, sometimes a year. They have an, a citizenship interview with an adjudicator at the government, and if all goes well, then they get approved, and they go down to the federal courthouse and get sworn in. That's immigration attorney Michael Harwin. It sounds pretty simple, right? Wrong. The N-400 is a complicated 20-page legal document filled with detailed questions about every part of your life that leaves me, a native English speaker with a graduate-level U.S. education, with more than a few questions. As for the interview, successful candidates must pass a civics test, an English test, and an in-person interview with the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, or USCIS, determining whether or not they are of, quote, good moral character. And increased procedural rigor has made the naturalization process even more arduous, Harwin said. Immigration law, starting with, you know, the Immigration Act of 1996, effective April 1st, 1997, really tightened up immigration procedures and laws, both for deportation and other things. And I think the general feeling is that since the Trump administration began, immigration strictures have become much more serious. Even becoming eligible to submit an N-400 in the first place is difficult, said citizenship teacher Jackie Osterblad. For many candidates, eligibility means being able to read, write, and speak basic English, having a basic understanding of U.S. history and government, and demonstrating an attachment to the principles and ideals of the U.S. Constitution. In addition, potential citizens must prove that they have been permanent residents for at least five years, that they have lived in the U.S. for at least the last five years and for at least three months in the state or USCIS district where they apply, and that they have been physically present in the U.S. for at least 30 months out of the previous five years. Lastly, each citizen must somehow prove that they are, quote, a person of good moral character. In general, the governmental organization that handles naturalization, USCIS, is happy to process naturalization cases because of their mostly positive outcomes. Gloria Goldman of Goldman and Goldman Immigration Law told me. They're doing their job. They're moving uh, pretty quickly with many more um, interviewers. It's the opposite of what you would think would be happening. In the political atmosphere, you would think things would get held up. They don't want these people voting. They may be more liberal. We're worried about the midterm elections. And none of that comes into play. Eric Cohen is the executive director of the Immigrant Legal Resource Center and a naturalization and citizenship expert. The ILRC is a national nonprofit that provides immigration law professionals and advocates with resources to better serve low income and working class immigrants. It can be a risk to apply for naturalization if, in fact, you're ineligible and you're denied. Um, naturalization costs a lot of money, and so you're losing all that time and money. Um, and there are some people who might actually um, have problems with their naturalization case such that the Immigration Service might do a, a full investigation of their case. Goldman is thrilled that USCIS is naturalizing so many people, but she thinks that the increased interest has caused top-down changes in the way naturalization cases are adjudicated. It used to be that the form that we filed for citizenship a case was about, I think, four pages long. Now it's 20 pages long. And the officers are required to ask every question. For example, if it says, have you ever been married? And, and they say no. Then they go on to say, um, are you married to more than one person at one time? And they would skip that question in the past because how silly. Now they have to ask that question. So they ask every detailed question. So our job is to go through all the questions and make sure we're not missing anything 
and having somebody placed in a situation where instead of becoming a citizen, maybe they're finding themselves in immigration proceedings. Yep, you heard that right. Applying for citizenship can get you into immigration court. Goldman says it doesn't happen often, and an attorney like her can usually address the problem. Sometimes what happens is somebody has applied for um, naturalization, and it is discovered that they should never have received a green card in the first place. Here's an example of a case Goldman is working on. A young Pakistani woman was waiting in Pakistan for a visa to come to the United States. During the time she was waiting, she turned 21, which backlogged the application her mother had filed for her when she was underage. In the meantime, while she was back there, uh, she got married, and that took her off the grid and, uh, because that voided her application. She never um, updated and said, well, I'm married and I have four kids now. Her number finally came up, and she moved to the U.S. Five years later, she came to Goldman with her naturalization application. She came to me, and I said, well, you're going to be denied because they're going to see that you weren't eligible to get your green card when you did. And because she wanted to get her citizenship so she could file for her husband and four children that are sitting in Pakistan waiting. So I told her, I said, look, this is what you have to do to fix this. You have to apply for citizenship, be denied. Then we asked to put you in front of the court, and there's a way to ask for forgiveness for that. But wait, there's more. The cost for filing the N-400 has increased over 700 percent since the 1990s. Adjusted for inflation, the filing fee should be less than $200 today. It's actually $725, and that doesn't include any legal fees for applicants who need an immigration attorney to go over the application with them, which many people do, especially if English is not their first language. That extra cost can be a barrier to entry for potential citizens, said citizenship teacher Jackie Osterblad. I think most of them are planning on it and saving for it. But again, the barrier is if they have to pay for a lawyer and the paperwork. They forget about the fact that they might need to pay for a lawyer, so they've saved up enough for the paperwork. But then they forget that they need help, you know, filling it out. Um, I have one student in my class right now who has taken the test before and failed, and so had to wait a certain amount of time and had to read people make sure you're ready before you take the test because it costs a lot. You have to pay for it all over again if you fail. While the interview is technically separate from the English and civics tests, Osterblad says the entire interview from Hello is an English test. Stand up for me. What are you doing? How are you? Come on in. Oh, I'm very good. Thank you. How was your drive over? Fantastic. Would you please raise your uh, right hand? Do you promise to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. On April 5th, I visited Osterblad's citizenship class at the Woods Memorial Library in Tucson, Arizona. Pima Community College's adult education program administers these classes and info sessions in English and Spanish at public libraries across Pima County. Seven women from all over the world attended this citizenship class in English to practice civics tests and interview questions. To pass the civics test, potential citizens must get six out of ten questions correct. The ten questions are chosen randomly from a list of 100 about American history and government. Good. Who lived in America before the Europeans arrived? The Native Americans. Native Americans or? American Indians. Good. What is one response? Halfway through class, Former student and new citizen, Cristina Castillo Ochoa, stopped by to say hello. Her former classmates scrambled to ask questions about how her final interview went. Ochoa has a master's degree in education from the Instituto Tecnológico de Sonora in Mexico. Six months ago, she didn't speak any English. Since then, she spent at least three hours a day, seven days a week, attending citizenship classes and practicing her English with fellow students. So you've submitted your application, you've studied the 100 questions, and USCIS has given you a date for your interview and citizenship test. There's a couple of things that can go wrong. If a person has a criminal record, for example, they may be ineligible for citizenship under the statute. 
Harwin said, and this is the important part. Even if they're not mandatorily ineligible or disqualified, the adjudicator at the immigration office has discretion to deny citizenship. That discretionary power can leave the naturalization process vulnerable to bias. Uh, my name is Reinoud van Wachtendonk. I was born in the Netherlands. Van Wachtendonk was naturalized March 25, 2016. He said his interview was a breeze. But from what he overheard in the cubicle next to him, it's not a breeze for everyone. I found it fascinating that these, these officers, you know, they treated me very, very kindly and very I thought easily, maybe because I am, you know, a, 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 a white European uh, guy. But as soon as they notice or think that they notice that there's something wrong, they do pounds. Here's Gloria Goldman again. And, and what I see is that in some cases, not all, um, and usually, it's usually been somebody maybe from the Middle East and we don't get an, an interview. We're waiting and we're waiting and we're told they're in some kind of administrative processing. And we have no idea why. Typical wait time is three to six months. And I have one like that that I keep asking about. And we just keep asking. And the only way you can unstick something like that is if you sue the government. And most clients don't like to sue the government for so many reasons. So we just sit and wait. There's been one or two cases that have just sitting out there. And they definitely were from the Middle East. But I have another client from the Middle East who um, has this naturalization interview coming up, and the processing time was um, typical of what we have. So it doesn't tell me anything. Goldman's client is an asylee and has been waiting for over a year for an interview. In citizenship tests and interviews, USCIS officers hold a lot of power said Tucson immigration lawyer Doralina Luna. For example, at one citizenship interview she attended with one of her clients, a mother from Indonesia, one misunderstood word almost cost the client her first attempt at citizenship. The officer asked, have you ever claimed to be a U.S. citizen? She said she did not understand. Like, boom, he puts his, his pen down and he goes, well, if you don't understand English. And at that point, I was so glad that I was there because I said, very nicely. Officer, can you use another word for that? Luna realized that her client didn't catch the word claimed, so she asked again, have you ever said you are a U.S. citizen? And she looks at him, her eyes get big, and she goes, oh no, she understood. And I was so upset because I said, oh man, and I always tell people that they don't need an attorney because they can do this by themselves, but here's this lady, and I know she speaks English. I know she does. And for whatever reason, the officer was in not in a good mood and maybe tired and maybe whatever. Um, but I was very glad that I was there. Sometimes things like that could happen. So for her, even though she does speak with a heavy accent, this is her country. This is her country and she wanted to become a citizen. According to Harwin, Goldman, and Luna, previous criminal history is the main reason why applications for citizenship get denied. There is that good moral character requirement again. And the places where people tend to get caught up are they'll have a misdemeanor from a couple years ago and they won't realize they're ineligible to apply. Goldman says that the most common criminal charge holding up citizenship applications is driving under the influence. And a DUI doesn't generally stop you from providing good moral character, but there's, a, there's an issue of discretion where an officer can decide that someone just as, you know, they've had four DUIs in the last five years, and they can go beyond five years. So you really want to um, provide them a lot of information about what's happened and why things have changed to go forward with the naturalization. Goldman says vetting of immigrants has been on the rise for years, in naturalization and in other immigration processes. While it can certainly help weed out people with serious criminal backgrounds, it also creates unforeseen issues for the average person. So I'm working on one where the woman has a large number of domestic violence uh, arrests, not necessarily convictions, but it's very apparent that she was the abused person. And often when the police gets called, both people get arrested or she gets arrested, and we're going to provide a lot of information to show that really this was a product of abuse rather than a product of her good moral character. 
Misinformation is also a big problem for potential citizens, according to Luna. I remember a long time ago, before I was a lawyer, somebody sent um, somebody over my way. I, I used to work for a congressman. And they were so scared because their friend had taken the, the interview and failed the test. And so this was a retake. And they were so nervous. And they said, if she loses, what is, what is she going to do? They're going to send her to Mexico. What's going to happen? And it was funny. I had to kind of just sit down with her and reassure her. No, no, no. You're still a resident. It's okay. What's, what's the disconnect here? New citizen Ken Murray thinks that confusion about the naturalization process may be due to how the USCIS sees itself. That's a bit of the audio track from a video entitled Faces of America that USCIS plays at naturalization ceremonies. It was, it was always Ellis Island shit, you know, I mean, the, the, the people in the Eastern European costumes and, you know, um, coming in on boats. In the 20s and 30s, get a grip. Where on earth are immigrants like that anymore, okay? I mean, when they were asked to stand up, you know, what country did you come from? Out of the 50 people there, probably 45 of them were from Mexico. So, you know, clearly the immigration service has this picture of themselves as, oh, welcome you huddled masses, this, that, that, the old tiny immigration stuff, and the video reflects that. But, you know, what is actually happening right now, I'm not sure that their image of themselves has changed if they've, got, if they've wrapped their minds around that. According to a 2017 Gallup study, the United States places 18th in a list of countries most accepting to migrants, behind countries like Rwanda, Iceland, Luxembourg, and Bangladesh. Over the last century, legislation has piled the red tape onto the naturalization process. But still, consistently rising numbers of immigrants decide that becoming a citizen is worth all the money and hard work. After all the research I did for this podcast, it made me wonder, does the naturalization process actually help us determine who would be a good citizen? I want to hear from you. Join the conversation by checking out the Why America website and connecting with me over email and Twitter. That's it for this episode of Why America. I'm Natalia Navarro. Thanks for listening.